Hi, my name is Ashley Okino and I'm the Executive Director at New Bedford Art Museum Artworks. And I would like to welcome you inside to our beautiful exhibition, Uncommon Threads, the works of Ruth E. Carter. Hi, my name is Jamie Uretsky and I'm the curator of New Bedford Art Museum Artworks. I also had the distinct pleasure of being one of the 12 curators of Uncommon Threads, the works of Ruth E. Carter. Today, I'm going to show you around the show. So come on, let's take a look. So first stop on our tour is the mood board wall. Mood boards are a huge part of Ruth Carter's process. It's where she gathers materials, ideas, um, uh, she does collage work that helps her think through how she's going to start building characters. And on this mood, and on this wall, we have mood boards from Black Panther, um, from Selma, and from Roots. And um, some of my favorite mood boards on this wall are these really, really cool images of tribes from um, Black Panther. So what she did was she went and she pulled some stock images of um, African tribes and created uh, fictional tribes that really are representing um, some of the actual tribes in Africa um, and then sort of making them, uh, bringing them into the 21st century. So you can see that with some of the clothes here. Uh, they're wearing suits and um, other sort of decorative garments from um, all inspired by African wear. Another thing you might notice when looking at these drawings is that uh, the films that were made earlier in her career, she did a lot of her own drawings and um, collages, but for a massive production like Black Panther, she actually uh, collaborates with illustrators Sometimes illustrators she finds on Instagram too, which is super cool. She's always looking at new artists. Um, so she'll, you know, make some mood boards and then collaborate with a contemporary, like a young illustrator um, to make things like these, these boards and these drawings and this, and this is what she ends up presenting to the directors. So it's a very, very cool process and really, really speaks to her character as someone who believes in mentorship and believes in um, young artists and bringing them up with her. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Lopes of the New Bedford Cable Network, and I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Academy Award winner and costume designer Ruth Carter. It was an interesting conversation, a fun conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. They say you do mood boards. Yes. Now, does the mood board come before a collage, or, or how does that work? Tell me what you're, something about your process. Well, uh, the mood board is a quick way of, uh, of developing like a roadmap, and it's a, a, it's a good thing to uh, work with your crew on because everybody um, gets to understand what it is you're trying to do with the scene. So I'll, um, I do them not only physically because I love to have mood boards hanging around my office, um, but I also do them electronically. So we're, we're compiling mood boards of all different types, you know, um, all at the same time. So it could be a scene from a movie, from the film or from the project, or it could be a character that um, has different uh, looks that we want to make sure that everybody is on the same time, on the same page. Because, you know, you can imagine something and explain it, you know, with your voice, but everybody will receive it differently. So until you actually physically put fabrics and tear sheets from magazines and ideas that, you know, are for color, color palettes, all of that goes on the mood board. And usually we, we arrange it so that it also collectively really gives you the mood of what that scene or that character is trying to portray. Well, I'm so. just curious, do you still have your first mood, bo mood board? Do you, do um, you I, have, I have sketches from college. It's in my exhibition. I have, I, I kept everything because I came from theater. You know, theater people, they collect, they save things because budgets aren't big. 
So because I was trained in that medium, I kept everything. So um, I started, you know, a very young loving to create and draw. And, and so I just immersed that into the process when I started. I've learned that something that's very important to you is mentorship. Yeah. Is, were you meant, were you a mentee? Is that why I you was. Wanted, Oh, well, tell us about that. And then, um, <sighs> well, I've had some of the best mentors. Um, my college professor, Linda Bolton Smith was my first mentor. And she was the one who said, you're not competing with the person sitting next to you in this classroom. You're competing with the grades. So if you want to be a writer, you're, you've got to write as good as Alice Walker. And I really never forgot that. She was uh, very much a, a fan of my, my zest and my zeal. And uh, she was the first person to tell me to uh, keep a journal and put all kinds of things in the journal, tear sheets of things you like, you know, not just writing, just make it this uh, uh, art piece. And, uh, and then she um, took the journal and she evaluated it after and she really gave me the idea that maybe I was uh, an artist, you know, and and uh, so I'm forever grateful to her. Um, and she was my first mentor, but I feel like Spike Lee was also a mentor. I'd never done film before, and uh, he opened the door wide and gave me advice and went shopping with me on occasion and, and became a mentor for the film industry. Nice. And now you are returning the favor by mentoring others? Yes. Um, well, I've always kept interns um, in my crew, and that's always been important to me. And um, I have scholarships. Uh, I have Mildred Blount Scholarship. I uh, just announced a new scholarship at SCAD. I have a scholarship at UCLA, and I have an endowment in my at my alma mater, uh, Hampton University. So. I'm um, constantly uh, trying to, uh, to, you know, influence those who want to be costume designers by, you know, making the road less bumpy for them and also giving them some adv advice. There are some really, really special objects on this wall that I want to show you. Um, first and foremost, we have two Ruth Carter drawings that are signed by the great and wonderful Oprah Winfrey. Um, very, very special items. And then also we have a beautiful collage that Ruth did. Some of my favorite work of Ruth is actually her collage work and her painting work. Um, so it was cool to get one of her collages from Selma. And I think it's a nice visual lead into um, our mural and our next stop in the show. Well, one of my favorite pieces in the show is this mural by Fitz Lamar. Um, we asked him to recreate a scene um, from the uh, march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, in Selma. Um, and there's a couple of key figures that I want to point out. Of course, we have Dr. Martin Luther King here um, and Coretta Scott King. Um, but we also have John Lewis featured here, which was really important um, for us to give a shout out to John Lewis as he passed away this last year. Here we are in the Selma room. Behind me, I have the costumes for Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King. They actually met in Boston, which is a really, really cool um, you know, hometown thing uh, that we can relate to, um, to these two amazing people. The outfits that they're wearing were inspired by um, the outfits that these wonderful humans actually wore, um, specifically from the cover of um, an Ebony magazine that covered the uh, Mount Montgomery marches. Um, and we do, uh, thanks to um, a local lender and also one of the curators on the show, Carl Carl J. Cruz loaned us that magazine, so we were super, super excited to get the original. Um, 
There are so many parts of this exhibition that I love so much, but uh, one of the touches that Ruth herself brought to the exhibition when she came through was to stage the mannequins so um, they really embodied the character. So you'll notice that these two mannequins are holding hands, they're supposed to be marching. You'll also notice the shoes on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who um, th these shoes were loaned to us again by a local um, vintage shop Circa and um, we wanted to put like hiking boots on him because that's what he wore when he was doing these massive marches. He um, oftentimes folks too would dress in their Sunday bests and um, through this exhibition I think I learned a lot about protest posturing and um, the incredible lengths uh, black and brown people have had to go through to just be able to exercise their right to free speech without being murdered um, and uh, they often did um, peaceful protests um, and still you know we know what happened at, at Selma and Montgomery so um, these costumes really sort of hit home for um, for me and it really brings these these uh, icons to life for me how involved were you in this exhibit? The one at the New Bedford Art Museum? Oh yes, um, I was very involved. Uh, we selected the items that will go into the ex exhibition together. Um, we had a theme uh, that we wanted to be more inclusive of my process and my story. So I was, I was thrilled to walk through and read some of my quotes and things. It's a very personal uh, exhibition and uh, really well done. It, it's small, but it feels very impactful. Another favorite thing um, in the show of mine is that we actually have two costumes that have never been exhibited before. And one of them is this beautiful red dress um, worn by Oprah Winfrey, who played Annie Lee Cooper in Selma. Um, this is the dress she wore when she went to um, go vote. And um, we really, really, you know, because we just had recently had an election, um, we really wanted to sort of drive home um, how difficult it was for um, people of color back then to um, have access to voting and unfortunately how difficult it is for many of us to get access to voting today still. So um, yeah, we love this piece um, and we really wanted a standout moment uh, for the Oprah dress. This is, I know I keep saying this to you guys, but this is one of my favorite pieces in the show. Um, this green costume uh, worn by Eddie Murphy in the film Dolomite Is My Name. This is another piece that has not been exhibited before. Um, we have two pieces from Dolomite Is My Name. We have the uh, iconic pink suit, but this green suit I really like because um, of the scene in Dolomite where he's, he's come, the character of uh, Dolomite is sort of coming to life and and uh, um, Eddie Murphy is sort of running through the house, sort of grabbing articles of clothing and holding them up to the mirror and, and doing different voices. And we really get to see how clothing can help shape characters. And he lands on this costume. And then in the next scene, we see him doing his first stand-up piece as the character of Dolomite. So um, when we think about clothing and how clothing helps us um, express parts of our identity, I think that this costume is a really good example of that in that film. When talking about Dolomite, um, it was important that I had curators on my team who actually lived through the 1970s and can give us firsthand accounts of what the 70s were like in New Bedford, um, what the 70s were like um, for a black person, what the 70s were like um, in general. And so we wanted to use those things to sort of create context around um, the costumes that you see here in the Dolomite section the work here, you know, many of these costumes, um, she just found these, uh, these patterns um, 
and fabrics that were dead stock, like they don't make these anymore. And then oftentimes she's dyed these fabrics. And when she makes the suits, she's not just thinking about how it, how it looks on camera, um, but really, really she's diving into all kinds of um, fabulous details here to really, really give the, the feel of uh, the 70s and the feel of who Dolomite um, uh, the character was and then who Rudy Ray Moore the actual person was. Yeah, one of the things that the, they mentioned in the exhibit here is that um, for, I think it was for an Eddie Murphy costume, you went by something that was in his closet or something that inspired you to do that. Do you know, do you know which one I'm referring to? I'm not sure, but uh, I work with Eddie. I think I've done seven uh, movies with him. So I'm very familiar with, um, you know, his body type and how he portrays characters and he usually doesn't want me to um, address the joke in the costume. He'd rather yeah, the costume be a real representation of the time and the period and the people who would wear such a thing and then let him do the joke. So the joke doesn't happen before he can open his mouth, you know, so um, and he, I believe there's a Dolomite costume in the exhibition and um he really he really admired like a lot of the comedians and rappers uh they admired rudy ray moore who was the person who portrayed dolomite who made up the character and it was just a character eddie wanted to play for a really long time and so i was really happy to you know help make that vision come to life my name is lindsay compton i'm a park ranger for arts and youth at new bedford whaling national historical park here in downtown new bedford i was a part of the curatorial committee for the ruth e carter uncommon threads show and i'm here in the malcolm x room I'm delighted to talk about it and i think one of the most exciting connections that i found in the research that i did was ruth's connection intimate connection with malcolm x and his legacy she attended high school for one year at a mosque that he set up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and also he spent quite a bit of time in Massachusetts and she was able to acquire some of his um, documents from when he was incarcerated. And we have them here actually um, par as part of her research. And I think that the deep, deep connections of um, these two individuals was one of the most exciting things to explore in the show and specifically her use of color when talking about Malcolm X's different phases of life. So you'll see the color in the suit is um, gray, black, and white. She used those colors specifically to show kind of the measured, calculated person that Malcolm had become toward the end of his life. And with the red zoot suit, you'll see far more attention uh, seeking. And you can see the, um, the stark contrast between the red zoot suit that he wore in his teenage years in Boston um, and in Harlem, and kind of the later in life Malcolm X when he was a prominent leader for the Nation of Islam. The t-shirt that's in this case is actually signed, autographed by Spike Lee. And this comes from a local um, historic preservationist, Carl Cruz. Um, this shirt comes from his personal collection, as well as many of the other items in these cases, including the vintage ebony and vintage life magazines that you'll see throughout the show. This quote here and all of the large white quotes that you'll see throughout the exhibit were actually pulled directly from Ruth Carter's words. And this quote here is specifically about how she works with actors to develop the character. She doesn't have a singular view of the character. She works with the actor to develop it as the actor is becoming more comfortable with playing that person. Do you have a, a specific quote that comes to mind that um, you st stays in the back of your mind always? Is there just one? Yeah, um, I would say the one quote that stays in my mind is trust your voice because uh, all, all along my journey, you know, through the ups and downs, the ins and outs, you know, I could always come back to like my voice, my inner voice, my purpose um, to find direction. Because a lot of times people want to tell you 
how to do your job. And it can be really confusing if you start listening to a lot of different things. And I, I was given great opportunities. Uh, Spike gave me an opportunity at the very beginning. And I think he was the first person to say, you know, let's see your ideas. Let's see what you have. Let's see what you hear. Let's hear your voice. So uh, my favorite quote, quote is to trust your voice. Nice. Nice. Have you um, ever designed something and then you saw the actor who would be playing it and you say, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that happened in Amistad, where we had the uh, Queen Elizabeth of Spain, Queen Isabella of Spain. She was the 16-year-old, a 13-year-old queen. And then uh, the actress that played the role was uh, 16 or 18. She was much bigger. And we waited a long time. Uh, and then we finally started making the dresses before we knew who she was. And they were for a 13-year-old. And a 16-year-old showed up. So we had to start from scratch. <laughs> Um, so that has happened. I mean, it does. It, you learn uh, not to be too uh, quick to pull the trigger. Um, it is a collaboration. And so I'm always interested in seeing who's playing the role. And so in my fitting room, we have, a, you know, a collaboration. We have a consultation. We talk about the character and how they're going to play the role because, you know, they're in front of the camera and it's not just my imagination versus theirs. It's ours together. Do the Right Thing uh, was one of her earliest films. It's a Spike Lee film, um, a protest film, and um, when I sort of went back and rewatched the film for the show, I was really struck by how, um, you know, that was shot in the mid 80s, and how um, here we are in 2021, we had just all survived 2020, um, and um, not a whole lot has changed. So, in the Do the Right Thing room, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to celebrate the Mookie character really show off the pizza uniform. The uniform he wore um, when he was both delivering pizzas for Sal's Pizzeria and when he threw a trash can through the front window of Sal's Pizzeria after Radio Raheem was murdered by the police. But also it's important to think about like how the, a protest film like Do the Right Thing can resonate for us here in New Bedford today. We have this poster that is a recreation of a photograph taken by local artist Darnell Staley. Um, on it we have a piece of writing from two of our curators, um, Jess and Micah from Rememory Consulting, um, talking about some of the um, contemporary Black Lives Matter protests and um, how they relate to the film. And then over here in the case we have have a couple of different cool objects. We have homemade t-shirts, hats, and masks um, from the Third Eye Unlimited collection as well as a Carl Cruz collection. Um, you can see here that uh, on the white hat um, are the names of um, the folks who were murdered by police in 2020. Um, and uh, we have some of these these BTU um, Black Lives Matter pins from the Carl Cruz collection, and of course these t-shirts from Third Eye Unlimited. You have to say hello to Dana, because Dana is kind of a groupie, but just want me to introduce him that, to you that way. Oh, hi Dana. Um, let, let me say it in my own words. I was okay. an extra in Amistad. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and, and I've worn your costume. Uh, I was- right. uh, Scheduled at first to be a person on the streets, a very wide shot. And yeah. in wardrobe, they changed my outfit to be uh, in the print shop in the uh, upstairs of the church. Oh, yeah, that was a good set. Very nice. I mean, it was very close. And I got the chance mm -hmm. to kind of get in there and walk yeah. toward the camera. Right. I made it in the final film, so... Oh, beautiful. Thanks to your wardrobe department, I wasn't just somebody on the street. <laughs> oh, congratulations. That's yeah, all yeah. that we have time for today. Yes, no. I'm, I'm gonna I'm have I'm to <laughs> I'm gonna have to mute and, and disappear, but I'm still recording. So Okay. Thank so, you. Oh, good to meet you, and I'm glad you had a great experience. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that he's gone.
um, I understand that you started you, when you were in, I guess, in high school, college, you wanted to, you were starting as an actress. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I was involved in a lot of programs that Massachusetts uh, funded. Um, one was called Uhuru Sasa when I was in high school, and it was at Amherst College. And you went and you learned about drama and dance and music. Um, and then I was an upper bound kid uh, where we were at UMass and we were, you know, getting, um, getting remedial help with our school work, but also we were learning drama and that's where I fell in love with drama. And uh, so that led me, you know, when I uh, went to Hampton University and, and went to college, I actually started as a special education major because oh, wow. um, education was a big uh, deal in my family. Um, I came from a legacy of teachers, aunts that were teachers. And so I thought I wanted to learn sign language and work with the theater for the deaf. So I, I, I went to study special education, but really was drawn to the theater. So, you know, my extracurricular activities at, at school were all around the drama department. And then I finally, after two years of special education, I changed my major to theater arts. And that's when you got interested in costume design or you're still talking acting? I was still at, uh, wanting the um, acting part and uh, I auditioned for a play and didn't make it. And so the professor who was directing the play said, you wanna do the costumes? It was kind of the consolation prize. <laughs> <laughs> But what I discovered was that I could um, actually like immerse myself in all the characters, not just one. And it was a great outlet because I, you know, had been uh, teaching myself how to sew all along throughout, you know, junior high school and high school. And, and so it became something that I felt I could do. It was like an art form that I, I immediately connected to. Oh, great. So what was your first um, job as a, a, a costume designer? I, I, unless you just started at the top, that would be awesome. <laughs> no, I did an internship in uh, Springfield, Mass. after graduating at Stage West. Um, and then I did another internship at uh, in New Mexico at the Santa Fe Opera. Then I moved to California and I got my first professional job backstage as a dresser for the Los Angeles Theater Center. Oh, that's great. What was your first job as a, as a full-fledged costume designer? Which one was your first baby? Oh, my first job as a costume designer was for Spike Lee and it was school days. And I'd been doing theater and so I knew how to break down a script and I knew how to do mood boards from theater. I knew how to sketch from my theater experience. I just didn't know the film medium, but I, I was on a project, um, School Days, which was about you know life on the campus of an HBCU. And I'd gone to one, so it was a familiar subject matter. Oh, where did you go? Just out of curiosity. I went to Hampton University in Virginia. Okay. All right. I, I was, I lived in DC for a while. So did Dana. So ah. kind of sort of almost know the area. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah. We're the sister school to Howard, you know, Oh, <laughs> definitely. We know Howard. Yeah. So let me just ask you, and I'm sorry if we're, we're going to bump around, but I'm, I'm kind of picking your brain from an artist point perspective. So I guess sure. artists know this. Yeah. Okay. Is it more difficult or to, well, how difficult is it to create uh, costumes for like a, a Spike Lee film, School Days? Is it more difficult than doing something for Black Panther? They're different. Um, I, the, the similarities are you have one leader that, that would be Spike Lee on School Days and Ryan Coogler on Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And when you come from independent films like I do, you know that the nucleus is your director. You know that you're really trying to be attuned to their vision. Um, and so in that manner, they're both uh, alike. 
Um, with Black Panther, you have what you what are known as specialty costumes, and they're made with def with so many layers. You have a you have a muscle layer, you have a tap skin layer to the Panther suit that also gets another layer of you know molded parts that are glued on and 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 arranged in a dynamic way. So there's a lot of preparation involved with making that one costume on a movie like. Um, do the right thing or school days. It's a, it's more uh, hands on creativity. Um, I feel like when we put that together, we we had an imagination about what the fraternity step uh, guys would look like, what the what the pledges would look like, and we cobbled that together on our own as a department. You know, by hiring you know extra costumers to to come up to make that that look come about but on a movie like black panther you can't do that without specialized equipment and you have to outsource to bigger companies to help you get some of these super suits made what was it like to win an oscar nerve-wracking <laughs> was it, was it, did you believe it did you believe it when your name was called was it just i mean did you go um, you know, I realized that anything could happen. So I didn't want to be presumptuous. I was, you know, I, I felt really good. I had a speech prepared, um, but I wasn't sure whether I, I was going to be able to give it or not. And then and then you see the people that uh, fortunately that year Spike was nominated. And so I could look around me uh, in the audience and immediately see people I started with like Spike and see the cast members of Black Panther. So I, even though I, I prepared a speech, I felt like so much in my heart that I wanted to say to them, they only give you like a little tiny bit of time. So. I, I managed to get a thank you into Spike at the top of my speech. So it felt really great. Do you do a lot of research before you do your costuming? Yeah, I don't think you can start without the research. And um, sometimes you get started with just a little piece of research. It could be one photograph that really inspires you and you feel so strongly that that is the look. And there's so much about the either character in the photograph that, you know, inspires the color palette, inspires the texture, and ins inspires the way things are worn. You just start beginning, um, but you can't just rely on your imagination because sometimes we're influenced by the wrong things. I mean, unfortunately, we've been uh, we've been colonized and we've been influenced, and our 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 role in some of these jobs is to present a true depiction, and we need to read a little bit and research a little bit so we can actually learn too. Do you, um, I'm just assuming that jobs come to you now, or do you have to go uh, and jobs? Well, okay. Um, I would say I was very lucky in the, in the beginning, in the 80s, when Spike Lee called me every year, every time he got a, a, a script, I was the costume designer. And in between Spike, I was called to LA by Robert Townsend or Keenan Ivory Wayans. So I bounced back and forth for 15 years. I really never had to look for a job. And now that uh, more independent filmmakers are now, uh, you know, in play in Hollywood and uh, a lot more um, of our stories are being told, um, people look at my body of work now and they, and they seek me out. Um, it's, it's more far reaching, but it's never been a case for me. I mean, there's been a couple of lulls when I thought, hmm, am I going to work? And then here comes Eddie Murphy, you know, and then I do seven movies with him. So I've had a really nice career just based on the time that I came into this industry. One of the things I feel super proud of with the show is um, our, how we collaborated with some community partners. Um, our partners on this exhibition were, of course, us, New Bedford Art Museum Artworks, um, the New Bedford Historical Society, um, the New Bedford Free Public Library, the National Park, and CVPA UMass Dartmouth. And one of the things that the um, UMass Dartmouth students did was they worked with me in developing um, 
the graphic design for the Ruth Carter exhibition. So um, on this wall behind me, we have sort of their process work. We have the statement from the professor who I worked with. So in the vein of Ruth Carter herself, who likes to bring young artists with her, like lift them up, um, we wanted to do a similar thing. So um, we were so lucky to work with these smart and talented um, young people and they picked uh, historic fonts, um, fonts that, that were inspired by the I Am A Man posters from the Million Man March <laughs> um, and also the women's suffrage movement. So. Uh, we, we did a lot of research, we did a lot of thinking and some design, so you'll see their design work um, hopefully all over the city. So you have exhibitions in different parts of the country going on at the same time? Yeah, well, it travels. They will travel. So the uh, New Bedford exhibition is one where if you have a small space that you want to put the, um, and that's the Truth Ruth up, uh, you can receive it. And then there's a uh, 5,000 square foot exhibition um, that can go into a larger venue. Now, you've got to explain the name. And that's the truth, Ruth. <laughs> well, Spike Lee came up with that in um, Do the Right Thing. Um, Samuel L. Jackson says it on his radio show. And, uh, I, I, you know, we all were shocked that that phrase was in the movie when we were doing Do the Right Thing. And then Spike kept it going by saying it all the time, you know, signing you off on, you know, and that's the truth, Ruth. And it stuck. And so I, I felt like, you know, it, it was a part of my film, film family. It was like a nickname and um, decided to use it. Oh, and he did it every time he does it. It's a shout out to you, right? <laughs> I sort of feel that way. I'm, if he I'm, doesn't stop doing it, I don't know. <laughs> what well, are you doing in Atlanta? I'm here on Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever. Yes, so, Wakanda Forever. Yeah, yeah. We're making the new movie and um, we're, we're, we're dead smack in the middle of it. Okay just between you, me, Dana, and, and the rest of the people watching the show. Who's the new Black Panther? Can I tell you? I know. Those are they'll, secrets. They'll come and do something bad, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, Marvel's like the CIA, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, That's the big surprise. I mean, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to ruin it for anyone. And I, I wouldn't want to know because then I'd spread it and that would be the <laughs> Have you ever done television? Oh, yeah. Well, I did the pilot for Seinfeld. Um, I have done TV series. I did one called Shark with Jimmy Woods. Um, I did Yellowstone, the Western with um, uh, Kevin Costner. And so I do TV from time to time. It has to be a really, really great director, really good storytelling. Um, those kinds of choices I make. Uh, TV is brutal. Ooh, it's brutal. It's like... <laughs> It, once it starts to get running, you, you, it doesn't stop and you get a new script every eight days. So it's something else, television. I applaud anyone who's in the TV industry. Do you have a, a I know you said Spike Lee is one of your favorite people to work with. Do you have, yeah. a, a, do you have a, a, a favorite film where you look oh. at it and you just say, I'm so proud of this. It was a lot of work, but it's wonderful. Do you ever do you ever do that? I do. Um, Sparkle was one of my favorites that I did. Um, and What's Love Got to Do With It is one of my favorites. I, I, some of my films I could watch uh, over again. Amistad, you know, was one that I really loved. Just the artistry of it and the experience that I had working with Steven Spielberg. And I can see all of that in the work. And I was so young and naive and just, you know, I just had my head down and was doing the work. So um, some of those are my favorites, but every once in a while, something will come on television. I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch Dolomite right now. Ah, you know, so uh, they all, it, it rotates. My favorites just rotate. Do you, when you watch those movies, do you, watch the movie or do you watch your costume? Oh, they're not wearing that right. I should have done this. I mean, 
Uh, in the beginning, that's the way it is. I think I have to see a movie like two or three times. Black Panther was that way. I, the first time I saw it, I was, gee, I cringed and I thought, I got to see it again. About after the third or fourth time, I calmed down. I know that uh, it's, uh, there's nothing I can do about it now. You know, it's in there. So you might as well sit back and enjoy it. Oh, that's funny. Three or four times. That's, that's kind of, <laughs> I, I, would you consider someone who's very hard on herself? No, it's just that I'm very close to it. You know, I, I know everything that went into getting that costume on that actor. And I know all about the the difficulties with wearing it. And so it just takes me a minute to just chill out. Okay. <laughs> hey, that brings a good question. How do you get yourself to, to chill out? How do you chill out between movies? I mean, what oh, yeah. Well, you got to do that for sure. You need to actually balance out. It's a lot of stress making movies, a lot of deadlines and you get actors at the last minute and they they have their expectations are very high. So and yours are, too. You don't want to put just anything out there. And so it's, uh, you know, a place where you go creatively. That's pretty intense. So when you're not working, it's pretty intense too. the way you have to uh, balance that out. And and so the first thing I do is I sleep and, I, uh, you know, wake up late, you know, go to bed early, just relax, drink tea, have nothing on my plate. That's the first rule. And but I also I like to paint. I've always paint and drew as a kid. I have my brother, Robert Carter, as an artist in Springfield and growing up with him and my brother, Roy, all we had art around us. And uh, it's a soothing thing for me. And so I'll, I, I always start a new canvas when I'm um, when I'm at home. I'm not a brilliant artist. I don't paint enough. I'd love to paint more, but um, I'm always learning, watching YouTube videos and learning new styles of painting. I paint with oil and I, I uh, draw with chalk and, and graphite. So I, it's something that I just really, really love. Well, it's interesting to hear you say you're not a brilliant artist because artists work in all different kinds of media. And, you know, you may not be a, a brilliant painter, but uh, you sure have it together with costumes. And so. <laughs> Thank you. I found an outlet and and I, it, I, it does it does um, touch that creative sense that you might have for all the same principles apply. You know, you have a background, you have a foreground, you have a palette. All the same principles of painting apply to costume design. It's, it's a fascinating um, approach when you look at it that way. Do you approach um, projects like you say, okay, I did Selma, I did Dolomite, I did, let's do something weird. Let's do Black Panther. <laughs> or do um, I, I, I've done Black Panther. I've done, you know, way out there. Let's just, you know, go back to something like Selma. I mean, do you, do you have to like give yourself a break? Um, uh, I love what I do. Um, and nothing is uh, work to me. It's all joy. It's all I live for it. So it, I find something new and interesting in every project, no matter if it's the same era or I'm returning to Black Panther again. Um, there's a new story. There's a new script. So I find something intriguing in in creating a new palette and bringing out these characters and just thinking about what I can do that would be unseen before or or what would be challenging. And so it I never get it never gets old for me. I never get tired of it. Now you're from Springfield, Springfield, Mass, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So New Bedford's kind of home, huh? Can we? Yeah, come it is. All Massachusetts, so. Do you totally. Think, do you think you'll be coming back to New Bedford anytime soon? Oh, I would love to. I just love the coast there. Um, I I bought some really beautiful figurines when we were on Am Amistad, and we were in that whole uh, New Bedford area. I just. I just love it. I love the smell of the coast and the and the clams. Oh, I gotta come back. The, hey, are the scallops now? Yeah, scallops. the scallops. Yes, some of the best seafood in the country. But you yes. know, not right. to brag. Mm -hmm. Not to brag. So anyway, what would, if you could do any project in the future? What would it be? 
Hmm. I think I would love to do something about the Harlem Renaissance because right. I love that era. I love the music of that era. And um, I just, I think it's not done enough. So uh, Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so all you need to do is call up Spike and say, yo, Spike. Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. You know, get in line with probably the nine other projects that he's got planned. <laughs> that brings me to, our, to probably our, my, my last question is, what's in the future? What do you have that, that when you hang up with me, you're going to go work on another project? Let's not say Black Panther because because you won't tell me who that is. So we'll just Yeah, well, on. I'll be on Black Panther all the way to the end of the year. So that's really kind of got me all, you know, uh, involved till then. Then I'm going to take a little bit of a break and um, and see what's out there. We don't know. It could be something period. I wouldn't mind doing that. But I don't really know, and I'm and I'm not trying to know, honestly. I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. So before I let you go, there's a couple things I want to talk about. The first one is this acceptance speech. This speech really, really sums up Ruth Carter as a person. The first thing she says is, this has been a long time coming. She knows who she is. She knows that she deserves these kind of accolades. She knows that she's a national treasure. And we at the New Bedford Art Museum Artworks and all of our partners who worked with us on this show really wanted to dive into that, dive into her 30 plus year career of um, helping all people uh, understand and empathize with uh, the stories and the characters she creates. Um, She's a powerhouse of a designer. We are so, so, so fortunate to have her here in New Bedford, and I cannot wait for you guys to see this exhibition.